Shalom. Salam. And to the atheists in this audience, how the hell are you? <laughs> I'm going to come back to the atheists in a moment, all right? Um, for those who are expecting to hear about my reformist argument for Islam, we may need to wait until the sit-down, because actually what I want to do in my few minutes alone up on this stage is tell you about the journey I've taken over the past decade. Very, very personal journey, and it's rather surprising implications for all of us. Let me start at the start. Some of you know this, but well worth re refreshing your memory. Uh, my family and I come from Uganda in East Africa. We were booted out in the early 1970s by General Idi Amin Dada. And uh, as political refugees, my family and I wound up in Canada, God bless its soil, and that is where I grew up attending two types of schools. The regular, secular, public school of most North American kids, and then on top of that, every Saturday for several hours at a stretch, the Islamic religious school, the madrasa. And that's where I began asking what I thought were simple, but apparently became highly inconvenient questions. For example, why can't women lead congregational prayer? Where, where is there a verse in the Quran about that? There isn't. Uh, and why, I asked at the tender age of 14 to my madrasa teacher, why can't Muslims take Jews and Christians as friends. After all, my best teachers at public school, one was an evangelical Christian who never had to evangelize to me because he lived his faith in his deeds, and another was a secular Jew, my debate coach. Yes, you can blame it on him. <laughs> so why can't we take Jews and, uh, and Christians as friends? Well, at that point, my madrasa teacher blew his top uh, having been asked more than a few questions by me over the last number of years, and he warned me, look, either you believe or you get out. And if you get out, get out for good. Well, in that nanosecond that I had to decide what I was going to do, my conscience asked me, Irshad, what are you being ordered to believe? What he's telling you does not match at all with your reality. So you have to question it. And if that means getting out of the madrasa, then that is what you have to do, girl. And that's exactly what I did do. I walked out, and my mortified mother <laughs> had to be reminded by me that, Ma, just because I've left the madrasa does not mean I have left Allah. She didn't get it back then. Boy, does she get it now. And uh, over the next several years, pre-Google days, I will add, here's why that's important, since I was no longer welcome at the madrasa, I spent the hours that I would have been there every Saturday, I now spent at the public library, reading everything I could, not just about Islam, but about religions, cultures, and belief systems. And that is when I came across this marvelous tradition of independent thinking within Islam that, David's right, politics, and only politics, has shut down. Well, 2001 happened, September 11th to be precise, and that is when I knew I had to write the book that had been percolating in me ever since I was booted out of the madrasa. The book became The Trouble with Islam Today, A Muslim's Call for Reform in Her Faith. And it launched me on what I thought was going to be a few book tours, but it became a global, decade-long conversation. And you'll hear in a moment what some of the comments I got uh, from young people were about. But you all know, you all know, because the media has played this up big time, that during those tours, fatwas came my way, death threats came my way. Since 
said, 10 years on, I'm here to report to you that something very different is happening. Last year, I did a major debate on Al Jazeera TV with a conservative Muslim. And afterwards, yes, I got hate mail, but I also got what I call love bombs, a lot of them, from young Muslims all over the world who wanted to see more of that kind of debate and dialogue. And here's the most surprising part. Not a single death threat. Not one. That's progress. <laughs> it's kooky, but it's progress. You know who I am getting a lot of hate from these days? Missionary atheists who call me things like coward, who tell me in deeply vitriolic terms, which I won't share with you on this stage, but who tell me that even sticking with faith is but a fairy tale. And to them, I'm a hypocrite because I preach independent thinking on the one hand and yet am immersed in my love of God on the other. What I'm learning from this experience is that it is so easy for any of us to lapse into tribalism and insularity and, yes, irrationality, even as some of us preach rationality, for example, as atheists do. And um, I have to say to them, and I have, that they, too, need moral courage. Moral courage is speaking truth to power, but here's the key. The power, ladies and gentlemen, is not simply in Tehran, and it's not simply on Capitol Hill. The power is also in here, in our own selves, with our egos, the very source of these rigid notions of identity that compel us to cling to this idea that I and I alone have truth. You know, in so many ways, it was young people of faith, including young Jews, who pointed out to me in this global conversation during my book tours that I had a lack of moral courage. You see, they would often say to me, Irshad, understand, it's not just the trouble with Muslims. We're seeing a rise of dogmatism in our own communities, in our Hindu, in our Jewish, in our Eastern Orthodox communities. And you know what I did? I dismissed them. I cringed. My ego didn't want to hear their truth. After all, I had a thesis to uphold. I had books to sell. Well, a decade on, we're seeing chauvinism, cultural, religious, ideological chauvinism in the ascent in places like India, Russia, and yes, Israel. And with, with rising chauvinism comes defensiveness even among those who don't share that chauvinism. It's amazing, you know, every time I talk publicly about the rise of gender segregation among Jews in Israel, I'm often told to mind my own business. This, from non-Muslims, who would be the first to applaud when I condemn gender segregation among Muslims. And so they need to learn moral courage. They need to speak truth to power, that is to say, to their own egos. As the Quran tells us, God does not change the condition of a people until they change what is inside themselves. And Muslims 
continue to have to hear this. We still need to hear this big time. In my experience, ladies and gentlemen, a new generation is increasingly hearing this. The question I have is, are we hearing that generation? Or are we still stuck in our post-9-11 moment? In other words, is the Viagra of identity politics keeping our emotional defenses up? Thank you very much. <laughs>